Okay, this lecture is about operate conditioning, and we're going to start with some definitions to define what this is. So what we saw with classical conditioning, we learned that an animal or person can learn an association between two stimuli, right? The CS and the UCS, right? So an association, learning an association between two stimuli, classical conditioning. Here with operant conditioning, we're learning an association between a response and an outcome. And so it gets its name operant because now the behavior operates on the environment. The animal has, or a person, has much more control over uh, what they do. Remember the behavior in classical conditioning was uh, highly reflexive, right? The unconditioned stimulus was triggering that behavior. So it's much more reflexive in nature. Here the behavior is not reflexive in nature. Uh, it's much more volitional or under the animal's control. It also is sometimes called instrumental conditioning because now the behavior is instrumental in the equation. So again, it's not reflexive like um, classical conditioning. So this began, remember we talked about Thorndike at the very beginning and his puzzle box where he would put cats in a box and look at their escape. And based on his observations, he developed what uh, is called Thorndike's Law of Effect. And what it says is organisms engage in a wide range of random behavior. Some behaviors are met with positive outcomes. We now call these rewards, or we call them reinforcers, but Thorndike called them positive outcomes, and will become more likely in the future. So that's key. So positive outcomes more likely to happen in the future. And some behaviors are met with negative outcomes. We now call these punishers. Uh, not to be confused with punishment. This is actually sort of a, a, an outcome or stimulus. And negative outcomes, what will happen is the behavior will become less likely in the future, right? So that's Thorndike's law of effect. So what we saw with classical conditioning is that the behavior was a, a result of the stimulus, right? It's the salivation, it's the fear, it's nausea. And rather than playing a role in the conditioning, with operant conditioning, the animal's behavior determines the consequence by happening, right? So uh, the behavior is not reflexive. It's under the control of the animal. So there are four behavior consequence relationships. I'm going to take you through these. And again, this is terminology, so you're just going to have to start to uh, work with the terminology. And I'm going to try to break it down for you. So we can have two things happen. The behavior, which is controlling things, can cause a stimulus to appear. And if the behavior causes the stimulus to appear in the environment, that's a positive relationship. It doesn't mean it's positive from the animal or the person's perspective. It just means that the behavior is causing something to appear. So it's a positive, like a positive correlation in, in that relationship. The other relationship is the behavior could cause the stimulus to disappear or in a rare circumstance not be delivered, right? So this is a negative relationship between behavior and stimulus, right? So a negative relationship between behavior and stimulus, behavior and the stimulus disappears, right? Again, it doesn't mean it's positive or negative with respect to the animal or the person, as we will see. So you have those two relationships, either behavior causes something to happen or causes a stimulus to disappear from the environment, right? That's the idea. Then what we can have is the probability of the future behavior is increased. That's what reinforcement means. So the behavior is reinforced. So we have reinforcement. Uh, that's what that term means. Or the probability of the future behavior is decreased. That's what we mean by the behavior is punished or punishment falls into this category. And so it depends here on what the relationship is. So if the stimulus is what we call an appetitive stimulus, so an appetitive stimulus is something that uh, is reinforcing, it's desirable, right? So like a piece of food, we would have a condition called positive reinforcement because positive because the behavior is causing something to happen and because it's an appetitive stimulus, it's gonna reinforce or increase future behavior. Now if the stimulus is aversive, unpleasant, painful, for example. If the behavior causes that stimulus to appear and it's an aversive stimulus, painful, that's called punishment. Now sometimes people call this positive punishment. I'm just gonna call this punishment to keep this a little easier uh, to uh, keep the terminology a little bit easier to keep straight. But what will happen is behavior 
uh, if it's followed by that aversive stimulus, uh, behavior will be decreased, it'll be punished. So for example, if we're talking about uh, an, an animal pressing a bar, if the animal presses the bar and gets shocked, its probability of pressing that bar again in the future is much diminished. Actually, let me give you a couple of exa more examples of positive reinforcement too now that I think about it. So this can be wide ranging, right? Like child cleans the room and you praise them. So it could be praise, right? So children and dogs like praise or animals like praise. You call the dog when he comes and you give him a dog biscuit. Uh, that would be positive reinforcement. Slowly you can shift to, to using praise if you move from a food reinforcer. A uh, rat is in an opera box and presses a lever and gets a piece of food. That would be positive reinforcement. Similarly, rat pressing the bar and gets shocked, that would be punishment. Uh, if the dog chases the cat, you yell at the dog, scold it, and it, you're trying to decrease the probability of future behavior. That actually happens in my household, right? Tank sometimes chases Shady, so that's, that's what happens. Okay, so those are the first two. Now let's consider the other side. So the other side is, is if the behavior causes the stimulus to disappear, so this is what we mean by negative, and it's an aversive stimulus, well then you have negative reinforcement. You have negative reinforcement. I know the terminology can be confusing here, but the behavior is actually strengthened, right? So in that way, it's like positive reinforcement because the probability of future behavior is increased. There's actually two kinds of negative reinforcement that we'll talk about. So there's escape. So let's suppose you have, and I'll give you a simple example here. Let's suppose you have an animal in an opera box and you deliver a shock and the behavior, the behavior, the bar pressing, causes that shock to disappear. That's going to be reinforced. The animal's going to be faster to press the lever and more likely to press the lever in the future. That's negative reinforcement. But that's escape because the animal is escaping the shock. It feels the shock and it's escaping the shock and it's and turning it off. We can have another situation where you pair like say a signal like a light and the light comes on and if the animal presses the bar uh, before the shock is delivered it can prevent it from being delivered. It can prevent it from being delivered. This is what we call avoidance. And so avoidance is negative reinforcement also it's a special case that we'll come back to. But the idea here is that um, if you have a way that the animal knows the shock is coming and if it can behave to prevent it from happening, it will. And that's called avoidance and it's part of negative reinforcement. So some other examples. Uh, if you turn off an annoying TV show or a commercial, uh, if you skip the commercials, you're escaping that, right? The um, seat belt. So the seatbelt sound in your car is attempting to use negative reinforcement on you. So you plug in your seatbelt so that you use it. Nagging is an example. If your mom's ever nagged you, she's using negative reinforcement. You do whatever she wants you to do to stop her uh, nagging. Uh, I have another example of negative reinforcement and it, it demonstrates, and this is our first cat, Rosa, and she used negative reinforcement on me. And this is when I was in graduate school. I knew about these relationships. I taught about these relationships, yet uh, she used it on me. And this just re or reinforces or explains or provides an example of how animals can use this on you to shape your behavior. So what she was doing is she was um, attacking our plants. And, you know, when cats attack your plants, it's terrible. They chew them up. They sometimes throw up because they're eating the plants and it's aversive to us. This example also illustrates uh, the perspective is really important in defining a relationship, um, which I'll explain uh, after I finish the example. So attacking our plant was really aversive to me. So what I would do is I would go play with her whenever she showed interest in the plant. And um, so this removed the aversive stimulus of her actually eating the plant and negatively reinforced my behavior. So she used it on me to get me to play with her. Now, if you take it from uh, Rosa's perspective, it's positive reinforcement, right? She goes over, hey, attack plant, I get to play. That's positive reinforcement from Rosa's perspective, negative reinforcement from my perspective, right? Uh, and I'll come back to this when we talk about extinction and things like that. 
uh, because there's some interesting effects. I saw I put her on extinction, which means you then don't reinforce the behavior and you get an exaggerated response. And that's something I'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, now, uh, but also uh, uh, more later on when we talk about extinction. Now, the last cell here is if the behavior causes a stimulus to disappear and that's an appetitive stimulus like a piece of food something you desire that's sometimes some people call this negative punishment uh, but we're going to call this omission because you sort of lose out you omit your positive reinforcement and this decreases the likelihood of future behavior happening so the classic example of this is timeout so if a child say misbehaves and you put the child in time out, you're attempting to shape that behavior and decrease the probability uh, in the future. Another example is if the host turns off the uh, music at a party, uh, once the party gets out of control, they're using omission to try to decrease the probability of crazy behavior, so to speak. Um, so a couple little tests for you here. Take a look at these cartoons. They're just kind of funny. See if you can sort of figure out uh, which one which one is which? This one is an example of punishment. You know, his dad lecturing is aversive to him. And this one is a little bit, um, it could be uh, omission. If you see the no biscuit, it could also be um, punishment by the bad dog uh, yelling, scolding at the animal. The other thing you can do is I want you to watch the um, Nanny, Super Nanny video. So Super Nanny is great because it shows you uh, child rearing, but it's all of these principles at work. And she shows you an example of using timeout effectively in a child who's sort of showing sort of a uh, well, long learning history of not having discipline. And you can sort of uh, see an example of what that's like. So take a look at that. And when we come back for part two, we're going to talk about methods for investigating uh, operant conditioning.